You are listening to the Fiddler's Forum with American violinist Alex DePew. Hey, well, we're going to have a good time today because this is going to be an easy episode for the likes of me. This is music for every occasion from 1995, I want to say. This was directed by good friend Sean Brady and WBGU-TV in Bowling Green, Ohio, Bowling Green State University. It's starting right now, the Fiddler's Forum. I predict that somewhere out there, somebody will see this and they'll say to themselves, this is the perfect time for America to take interest in family life. And here is a family that can play. What we don't want to do, Alex, is imitate. We want to make it to Pew family musicians. A father readies his sons for a chance at musical glory. You're going to have to win them to Bach, right? And you're not going to win them by, by taking a metal lunch. He's not training to become the featherweight champion or the bantamweight or the welterweight or the middleweight or the light heavyweight. He's tr training to become the super heavyweight champion. This is no game. You're either going to do this well or you're not going to do it at all. As the sons grow older, will the dreams of the father become their own? I remember him saying that if you, if you play your cards right and you practice like you should be, someday this will happen to you every night and every time you play and you will be treated like royalty. Will early encouragement translate into a lifetime of inspiration? You can't just quit. You can never quit. And can the love of music fill the void of personal tragedy? I say, well, how can I use this as an excuse to make me play better? A family grows up, on and off stage. Next on Music for Every Occasion, the story of the DePew family musicians. Music for Every Occasion, the story of the DePew family musicians is made possible by financial support from the D.S. Brown Company. Bowling Green State University, and the supporting members of WBGU-TV. can be both essential and incidental to our daily lives. For some, it inspires and uplifts. Yet for others, it passes by with barely a notice. In this consumer age, the musician has become another product to be used at our convenience. And much of what we hear has been calculated, categorized, and multiplied for the marketplace. But for the DePew family musicians, making music is a much different experience. For them, it is literally a way of life. And like modern day minstrels, they wander from stage to stage promising string music for every occasion. We played in the New York Bowery one time for a Save Your Soul meeting. And we saved five times more souls that night than they'd ever had saved in one given time. We played in fiddle contests all over the state of Ohio. We've played receptions for weddings. We've played in wedding ceremonies. We've played in barns. We've played in Carnegie Hall. 
where there are two or more gathered to hear them play, they will play. I can't think of a place they have not played. It would be easier to try and come up with a place they have not played. Uh, I don't think it's played on an airplane. This is the very first concert hall my pride and joy has ever played. Zachary John is six and will now join his brothers in the performance of Boré by George Frederick Hammond. For 18 years, Dr. Wallace DePew has presented his four sons to virtually anyone who would stop long enough to listen. Appearing throughout Northwest Ohio and Michigan, they have offered a musical program that ranges from classical to country and popular music. To this family, performing has been as normal as riding a bike, learned first with apprehension, then continued with joy and confidence. And the first step onto a stage has been a shared rite of passage. My first concert experience was at, a, at my church, Plain Congregational Church, and uh, I came up and I played my song, and I just remember everybody standing up, clapping, and I left the stage, and I didn't know what I did. I, I thought, wow, this is, it was fun, but I didn't know what I did. I didn't know that what I was doing was special. We were so small that they had to put us on top of a table. And this was the, the first job for money, I'm pretty sure. But they had to put us on top of a table and so that, so that the rest of the audience could see us. And I remember being so nervous, my, my leg was shaking so bad that you could hear my foot stomping against the table going <coughs> while I was playing. After Dad made a, made a huge introduction, as he always does, you know, he always, and he's done this and that, and here's my son, Jason. And uh, anyway, I think I came out with the violin in, in two. It was hanging by the strings and the neck was busted. And that was my debut. <laughs> I ran out on stage to grab my mom's leg and wouldn't move. I just, I was f frightened by the people. I grabbed her leg and just held on for dear life. It was a good thing they laughed, I mean, because the violin, even though it wasn't very expensive, it was still, you know, dad's money that he was paying, so I, it's, as long as they got a good laugh, then maybe it was worth it, I don't know. It's probably better for them to laugh than to actually hear me play, it was probably a better experience. <laughs> When a young musician displays exceptional talent, the audience is both entertained and tantalized. Where does this confidence and virtuosity come from? Are they merely precocious, or is this the beginning of a celebrated career? In the case of the Depew family, the questions multiply by four, and we find ourselves wondering about the young musicians we see before us. How does their ability and training combine to create such skill? And what makes them want to play? Is it a coincidence that all four brothers excel at the violin? Or is their family relationship the very reason they play so well? The more we hear, the more we wonder. I think you have four different personalities, four different musicians, four different abilities, four different ways of doing things, four different ways of feeling things. They're, they're, they're totally different. Uh, they have one common denominator. Dr. Wallace DePew right there with him. The deal I made with each of the boys was this. You don't have to be a violinist. When you grow up, you can become whatever you want to be. But I am going to give you the opportunity to become a violinist, if, perchance, that is what you wish to become. Now, you can't, at the age of 15 or 18, decide you're going to be a violinist. You have to decide 
that early. Now, that's why you're starting at five years of age, and by the time you're 18, you can tell me what you want to be. But you will be able to play the violin. The reason is I want you to have every day of the rest of your life a little more beautiful. And that's what will happen if you're able to play the violin. A father's wish for his sons offers both inspiration and challenge, for a wish is filled with hope, yet often shaped by expectations. And while some fathers content themselves with hoping, Dr. Wallace DePute does not. He has taken each of his sons from the age of five and fostered their education on the violin. And with every note, they fill their lives with beauty and make their father's wish a reality. excellence. I like to follow the scriptural admonishment of whatever your hand defines to do, you do with all your heart. Music is as important to me as it was to Tchaikovsky, who said, can you imagine a world without it? It's as important as life to me. Wallace DePue was born in the midst of the Depression to a poor working-class family in Columbus, Ohio. To support her two sons, Lillian DePue worked as a seamstress during the day and took on extra sewing at night. So I watched her work, and I learned a work ethic from her. And I learned that you can require things of yourself. If you say you can do something, you can make yourself do it. I watched her get out of bed and go to work when she was so sick with the flu that most people would have been in a hospital. But she'd always say, well, you've got to be someplace, and I've got to be at work. And she would go. Oscar DePue trained boxers when he could, working as a barber during the lean times. From my dad, I would always think what might be. I'd get a dream in my mind. The difference between my dad and myself was that I would go for it. Dad would get the dream, get it all organized, but never go for it. After his parents divorced when he was six, Wallace lived with his mother. Quick to fight, he did poorly in school. But his musical education fared much better. A high soprano, he was asked to join the Columbus Boy Choir, which is today the American Boy Choir. There he was introduced to a strict standard of discipline. When I went into the boy choir, we learned to read music, we learned to sit properly, we learned to accept authority, we learned that quick. And we learned how to handle ourselves in anyone's company. We had to study about protocol and manners. And uh, the unforgivable sin would be to embarrass the conductor anywhere we might go. And you knew what that meant if you were accused of it. So every boy was always very careful. Wallace also learned the piano and became interested in music composition. His talent was such that he went on to become the first debut to graduate from college, receiving degrees from Capitol and Ohio State University. While getting a doctorate in music composition and theory at Michigan State University, he met Linda Coleman, a graduate student in music education. She was movie star beautiful just beautiful. She was a full-blooded Swede who walked like a queen and had blonde curly hair and blue eyes, that just a, a movie star type, and a gentle, lovely nature. A real uh, princess. Married in 1965, they moved the following year to Bowling Green, Ohio, where he joined the faculty of Bowling Green State University. In addition to teaching, Dr. DePue became an active composer. In 1974, he produced the opera Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dr. 
Doctor, did he what inspired you to write an opera about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? I was taking one of those uh, speed reading courses. And one of the books that I was reading in that way was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the original novel. One thing after another led me into believing that this would be a wonderful topic for a contemporary opera. That's the Barbara Polecat. You know everybody. After establishing the first university-level barbershop music course in the country, he wrote something special, an opera composed entirely of barbershop music. You may tell your young upstart, my men will draw papers for a fight. Based loosely on the story of Gentleman Jim Corbett and the great John L. Sullivan, the production was inspired by Dr. DePew's own love of boxing, instilled back in his youth during hours spent at his father's gym. And I thought, well, this is what I'm going to be when I grow up. I'm going to be the world heavyweight champion. And at the time, I thought that's really what I was going to do. And my dad was so proud of me every time that I would do something well. And I always wanted to please him. So I believe that whatever a father does, he can teach his children to do, and his children will like it if they have any, any aptitude for it at all. To trifle with a star, for sweet revenge is mine. Wallace and Linda DePew had four sons. The first, Wallace Jr., was born in 1969. He was followed by Alexander in 1972, Jason in 1976, and Zachary in 1979. Dr. DePew wasted little time in encouraging his son's listening skills, and the sound of children and music mixed freely within the household. Some of the ear training, subtle ear training that my dad used to do, which gave me a sense that I might have some talent here because he'd sing something and then I'd sing it back for him and then he would critique pretty much what I would sing back and if it was exactly the way he sang it for me the first time. Even before I started the violin I sang all the time. I would sing all day, all corners of the house all the time. I was always singing. Music was around the house. My father played the piano when he'd compose compositions at the piano in the living room. And uh, when he'd be at work, my uh, mother would be practicing the piano all day. And so music was just all over the place all the time. When Wallace started to go to kindergarten, he was not able to do the things that the other children were able to do. He couldn't skip, and he couldn't catch a ball, and he couldn't throw a ball, and he couldn't hop. And so everybody was trying to tell me he was retarded. Well, I knew better than that. A physical revealed that Wallace's motor skills were underdeveloped. Dr. DePew was encouraged to engage his son in activities to improve his coordination. Well, I know that if you give a person a violin, that's a perfect coordinating instrument because you have two hands that are doing absolutely different things at the same time. I saw that he had a whale with a lot of talent. And he had uh, all the other characteristics. He had a, a passion for it. He had guts. He was always a courageous kid it still is today and you have to have that you have to have that inner strength if you're going to be a really top-notch violinist I began my boys at the age of five because 
At the age of five, they could play an instrument that was large enough to sound like an instrument rather than a toy. You can start children on eighth size violins, but I've never heard an eighth size violin that had a decent sound, and I didn't want to get the children accustomed to hearing something that was not a good sound. All good times are past and gone, all the good times are gone, all the good times are past and gone, well done, don't you weep no more. The concept of the musicians as a family began, oddly enough, in a nursing home when Wallace Jr. and I were the family musicians. I was playing at the piano, and Wallace needed to be elevated. So I got a chair and put him on a chair. And all of a sudden, the heat came on. Now, he was standing with his head six inches away from this heat blower, and it made his hair stand straight up, pointing toward the audience. And a, he never missed a note. He looked like he was going to be blown from the chair, but he never missed a note, and the audience loved it. And I thought, maybe we should start thinking about going everywhere, because everywhere we've been, some crazy thing like that has happened, and the audiences really loved it. After Wallace Jr.'s initial progress on the violin, Dr. DePew encouraged his other sons to take up the instrument as well and each brother helped inspire the next. I enjoyed the sound of the instrument and I thought, you know, watching my brothers, I, I thought to myself, well, gee, I, I think I could do that too. Within a few years, the violin became a focal point of family activity. There was music going on in our house 24 hours a day. Sometimes four violins at one time and a piano. It sounded like, I don't know if you've ever walked through a music hall at, at, at a, uh, at a music center at a university, but that's how it sounded a lot of the time with instruments doing scales and running each, each, uh, each different way and in every different key imaginable. To help maintain the boys' interest in practicing, Dr. DePew continued arranging local concerts. Dad would take us out after a, a performance, whether it's big or small, and, and I remember him saying that if you if you play your cards right and you practice like you should be someday this will happen to you every night and every time you play and you will be treated like royalty for the depew family musicians all the world became a stage and no event or location proved too unusual or unimportant the group was warmly received as they appeared across northwest ohio and beyond Audiences were as impressed by their youth as they were with their developing talent. And as each brother joined the group at the age of six, he easily stole the show. As they continued, the entire DuPew family eventually found its way on stage, with father emceeing and playing guitar, and mother contributing on the piano. My mom was very active musically. She was not only a pianist, concert pianist, I used to love and to listen to her play. I'd sit by the hour underneath the piano, which is the best seat in the house, and listen to her play by the hour. And uh, along with that, she'd sing in a uh, the Sweet Adeline's Chorus out of Toledo. She was a bass voice, which is pretty uncharacteristic of such a beautiful woman. With maturity, each son's ability to concentrate increased, and so did their practice time. By the age of nine, they practiced at least three hours a day, in addition to their weekly lessons and schoolwork. Maybe it was because we progressed at the rate we did, but uh, the pressure was on to, to sit in the practice room at home and become better and better. And sure, I'd, I'd look out the window and, and see all the neighborhood kids playing kickball and baseball and whatever else. And it was, uh, 
it was hard to stay up there and, and practice in, in the hot weather, you know, in the summer and watch all the kids out in the shorts playing. That's when you really have to depend on your heart more than your fingers. Because, um, you know, even though the fingers uh, play the music, it's not the fingers that do as much of the work as, as much as the heart does and the mind. We always had one thing that we agreed upon, and that was any time we perform for anybody, we're going to be good or else we're not going to perform. And I pounded that into their heads. This is no game. You're either going to do this well or you're not going to do it at all. Now, what about your second and third hours? Have you got them in yet? They'd say yes or no, and they'd have to get that time in. They loved doing it. It wasn't a matter of forcing them. They loved doing it. I just had to inspire them all the time to do it really well, to be better than anybody. With so much time devoted to the violin, Linda hoped the instrument wouldn't overwhelm her sons. Dad was always there, uh, I say this humorously, with, with, the, with the whip and chains, you know, making us go and practice and, and, and get busy and, and work harder. And she was more laid back and she wanted us to have fun and, and to experience the things that a child needs to experience in their childhood years. And I remember even at certain times that uh, they would argue about what I should be doing with my time. And not just me, but Wally and Jason as well. Uh, you know, Dad was, they, they need to practice. And, and Mom was, they need to play. They need to practice. They need to play. Dad was the disciplinarian. Uh, but Mom, after the disciplining was over, Mom was always there to present you some ice cream or something, some, something nice. And, and uh, it was it was fun practicing with mom it was, and uh, that's what I'll miss about her. Usually, I was driving to the lessons, and that I had done that that same week. I had taken a long drive with them, and I didn't want to do it again if I didn't have to. So, okay, let's let Wallace drive, and of course, Linda was sitting next to him. She has a driver's license, and... It was just I a normal day. We, we uh, packed the instruments in the car and, and headed up there, and for, for anybody to expect something like that to happen would be insane. It's a day I don't want to remember. It's, uh, it was just, I, to this day, I can see everything in vivid color. I taught him how to drive, and I'm a very tough teacher. I taught him things he'd never learn in driving school. But we sent him to driving school too. He was a good driver. The one thing I never taught him was that you could go to sleep and you shouldn't do that. It was the fault of the weather. It was the fault of the conditions. It was the fault of the tree that was sitting in the field. It was the fault of where it happened to hit one field and it hit right on her side. Dad and I went out to Burger King, came home and opened the garage door is off. You know, there's no car in there. My dad goes, this is strange. They're not home. And I said, oh, they'll be home, you know, a little six. It was a horror story. She was trapped in the car and she was terribly injured, leading to death internally. Still in control of her mental facilities. And Wallace was terribly injured. He jumped out. I came up to her before I left the car. That was, this was the last time I saw her. Um, and I, I pulled her head back and I looked in her into the eyes and, and I just, she was alive still, but I just, I didn't see, see anything. They called and told us about the death of my mother, like about 30 minutes later. And my dad was in tears. He was throwing things around. I mean, he, he, he was out of control. And I, only thing I could he said, uh, I did everything I could. And then I realized it, we lost her. And it was really a terrible hard punch. It was just something that knocked the wind out of me. So my best friend uh, 
was notified. And he came over and picked me up to see, to collect the children. I put Wally in the car and we made our trip to two hospitals. The one in Sylvania, I think that was Flower, where Alexander and Jason were. They were banged up, but they were okay. And he had to go into a room and tell them that their mother was dead. He, he took care of that. And then we went over to the uh, Toledo Hospital, where Wallace Jr. was, and he was banged up pretty bad. His head was cut pretty in a nasty way. And uh, he knew that his mother uh, was dead uh, when we got there. And we spent about an hour there until he was w felt strong enough to, uh, to get up in the night. I brought the three boys and Wally back home. And of course, it was a very, very bad snowstorm with the wind blowing, howling. It just seemed like everything had just gone to hell. <laughs> you know, there was a certain, people weren't talking very much in the car and, and I remember R.D. Matthew is the one that was driving, drove us home and he'd comment on the weather now and then. And uh, we consider ourselves pretty lucky that that uh, we all didn't <laughs> invite it. Times are passing gone. All the good times are gone. About five minutes before the car crashed, um, it was quiet in the car, and uh, she took the time out and she she just said to each person, um, "I love you, Jason. I love you, Alex." And you know, she'd always wait for the response, "I love you too, mom." I love you, Wallace. I love you too, Mom. And, you know, I love you, Jason. I love you too, Mom. That was the last, those were the last words she ever said to me. I regret terribly the loss of our mother and wife, but I rejoice singularly that if anybody had to be killed, it was not one of the boys. That isn't to say that I didn't love her as much as the boys. I love her in a different way. And she had all those years. They didn't have many years at all. Linda DePew was fatally injured in a single car accident while traveling with her three oldest sons to Ann Arbor, Michigan for violin lessons. And for a moment, the music stopped. And even though the judge can be hard on himself and unshakable in court... A week later, the family received an invitation to appear on the Christian Broadcast Network's 700 Club. I felt like saying, hell no. I don't want to be on your 700 Club. I don't want to be on Frank Sinatra's International Gala. I don't want to be on anything. That was my reaction. And then I turned to the kids and I said, I have to tell you what this is. You tell me what you want to do. You want to be on the 700 Club? National television? And they all looked at each other. One of them said, yeah, Dad, Mom would like that. All of them agreed, so we accepted. We knew at some point we would have to get over this and, and go on with our lives. I guess we all thought the sooner the better. Even if tomorrow my, all my brothers suddenly died, I think the only thing that would be that I could do is go to my violin and just practice and just work. You can't just quit. You can never quit. You don't feel the shock until um, actually the funeral's over and everything is coming home after school and nobody's there to see you or nobody's there 
Mom's not there practicing the piano. And uh, it was very empty. Dad was at work, and we'd come home to an empty house. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know, the shock doesn't set in until actually the regular life goes on. And that's when it hits you. And that's, and it tore me up for quite a while. But... Wallace became suicidal. And my dear friend Jerry Rose, the great concert pianist, said, you've got to get him away from you. You have to get him out of here. Well, I was financially distraught. I didn't have any way to send him anywhere. And Jerry got him a scholarship at Aspen, arranged it all, and sent him. And I talked to some uh, older musicians, you know, in their 50s, 60s, and they say, well, sometimes uh, tragedies in life um, cause a, a deeper sensitivity for music and everything. But I say, well, how can I use this as an excuse to make me play better? I, you know, that, that's not what I want to think about at all. Wallace would call me and say, I'm coming home, Dad. I can't stand it out here. And, you know, just depressed, depressed, depressed. No, you're there for the duration, son. You're going to stay there until you accomplish something. Now, I'm not rushing you, and I'm not telling you what to do. You just get up every day and do the best you can do, and as soon as you can, put the violin in your hand and go to work. I was, uh, I just was not alive practically at all. I was just, I was a zombie. And I guess he caught me one evening when I was so sick of it, I'd hear the phone ring, and every time the phone would ring, my blood would run cold because I wouldn't know what had happened. And I went over and I'm going to kill myself. And I said, OK, go ahead and do it. Quit talking about it and do it. But you're not coming home unless you come home feet first in a box. And make up your mind, but do this for me. Don't call me anymore. I don't want to hear from you. You're out there where you've got beautiful flowers all over the mountains, beautiful, perfect crystalline streams running everywhere. You've got friends who have an interest in you. And all you can talk about is killing yourself. I want to hear from you when you see the flowers, when you have a good time with the friends, when you play some music and you touch somebody's heart. Then call me, but don't call me before that. And I hung up. Now every time the phone rang, I didn't know what to expect. It was terrorizing me. I didn't think I could stand it anymore. And the next time I heard Wallace's voice, he said, Dan, I'm playing the violin. Oh, I've heard beautiful symphonies, but I never heard anything that was as musical and as good as that. That was the greatest single line of English I've ever heard in my life. And it just goes to show the kind of guts that boy has. He was picking it up again, coming up off the floor to win. That's my kind of man. Following Linda's death, music activities helped provide some structure and stability for the family. Wallace kept his sons focused on the violin above all else. My dad explained to me that I would be, I wouldn't, I'd be an original. I wouldn't be like the other kids outside playing basketball or baseball or something. You have an option. You can work like the devil from the age of five until you're 18 and play from the time you're 18 until the time you're 80. Or you can play from the age of five all the way to 18 and work like the devil from the age of 18 until you're 80. Which would be better for you? 
anybody in his right mind can see the difference. So my boys elect to work like the devil from 5 to 18. And it's not hurting them at all. You have to give up when you're little playing ball and, and little league baseball teams. I always wanted to be on that uh, when I was at the time. Um, yeah, there were a lot of sacrifices, but it pays off in the future. You have to study your schoolwork or you're going to flunk out of school. You have to practice your violin three hours a day a minimum, minimum, if you're going to compete with the big boys later on. Now, if that takes all your time and we have to leave play out or leave it to be timed to a minimal, which one would you cut out? You have to cut out the play. And he'd be the first one to tell you, no, they don't have time to throw the ball, as he would say it. That's the kind of inflection he probably would do. He didn't, we don't have time to throw the ball. And uh, he wants them busy. Uh, you can throw the ball after you're, after you're set in life. Uh, I think that's how he feels. Right now, prepare for what life has. I still have to agree with that, too. If you spend your time as a kid, being a kid, I couldn't see. If I had done that, I would probably still be a kid you know instead I'm I'm holding my own as a musician amongst some of the best musicians now second place is Alex Depew with their dedication all of the brothers did well in the area fiddle contests and violin competitions among the contestants were Zach Jason and Alex Depew of Bowling Green and although all of them loved the joy of competition Zach had an ulterior motive for being there I just came here to beat my brothers <laughs> We do a lot of family concerts together, and um, we we uh, do practice together, but we, we usually practice by ourselves a lot, too. How often do you practice? How many hours a day? Three hours a day. It's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah. Don't you think so? I don't practice three hours. Who practices? The oldest of the three contestants, 14-year-old Alex, will take his skills to Carnegie Hall in November. With the violin and schoolwork keeping them busy, and Wallace Sr. working full-time, there was little time for anything else around the house. It was a mess, but it was a funny mess, because there were violins playing in all corners of the room, and there were five men that lived in that house, and they lived like five men. They didn't have time to clean up. It was hectic at the Depew household. <laughs> we had five different guys doing their laundry at different times, so the thing was probably fighting for its life. I'm talking about the washing machine. No, please, not again, not again. I would come in and I would look at it and i say, Wallace, why don't you take some time to clean this up? We're going to do that right now. Jason, get in here and clean up this room. Well, if he could have brought a bulldozer in, it would have helped him. He would have gotten done in an hour, I think. Everyone was cooking their food at different times. We did not have meals together <laughs> that often. If we did, it was because we were invited to, to some good soul's house to have dinner. The worst thing about it was not the physical labor and all the uh, emotional stress. The biggest disadvantage was it was as though they spoke a different language. I could not converse with them on any given subject. Now, it was like grunt and point. Uh, go wash the dishes. Uh, go make the bed. Uh, go shine your shoes. And those sentences they can understand. But if I want to talk about poetry or great literature or any of the things that interest me, they don't know the words. The boys all love girls now. Well, half of them do. Half of them hate them and half of them love them. So those that love them are able to go out on dates and have a nice time, whatever. Make, make that three-fourths. <laughs> oh, gee, New Jason, one. our et tu <laughs> Well. Zach still Zach loyal. still. Do you want to see me kiss Zach with lipstick on? Hold him. Ah, Hold him oh. for me. Today, Wallace Depew is remarried to Elaine Markopoulos, a Toledo school teacher. 
and she has helped restore balance between violin and home. Well, the impact was instant and dramatic. I mean, you went from cleaning the rooms out with a shovel and a bulldozer to an immaculate person. I mean, you went from one extreme to the other. That's great because, you know, you perform one night and there are lots of people and, <laughs> and then the next day you wash the toilet. <laughs> That's great, though. It's humbling. Far beyond the playing of the violin, they must be people of good character. Character is, is what makes a person uh, what he is. It's something which uh, is brought out by a person's responses, um, mode of thinking, uh, actions. That comes beyond anything else, whether it be the violin or whether it be uh, any other field of endeavor. Wallace Sr. continues to work with his younger sons as intensely as ever. Driving. No, no. You're not going to get off the hook. No, no. Scolding. Do it again. Crazy. He can stand over them, but they have to have the commitment inside. And no matter how much he stands over them, if they don't have the commitment inside to achieve and to improve, they're not going to improve. He says, if you want to quit, that, that's fine with him. That, that has never entered my mind in doing that. But he says, if that's really what you want to do, if you, if you can't, if you don't consider practicing what you want to do, then don't do it by all means, do something else. Quitting the violin would ruin his dream of having four sons playing the violin. And this is what I do is for my dad. Everything I do is for my dad because he started me and this is what he wanted. I would always love to play the violin. I would love to become not exactly world renowned. You know, I'm not looking for fame. I don't want to be, become famous. That's secondary to, to anything, to, to my first first thing that I want to do is, is just be able to go out on stage and make a message to an audience, you know, and hopefully they'll get my message. I just want to keep on playing and keep on developing, you know, my, my repertoire and performing my repertoire and, and, um, and just having fun with it. In 1993, the Depew family musicians found themselves at a musical crossroad. Wallace Jr. and Alex no longer lived at home, and concerts were becoming more like small family reunions. On stage, there was no longer a father coaxing four young boys. Now four men stood there instead. We're in the process of letting Dad know that those days are gone and that the time that and the times that he used to come out and introduce us as our these this, these are my, my child geniuses that, that play the violin, they're prodigies or whatever he decides he wanted to call them. It's no longer like that. Now we're we're pretty much a big boys and, and we have to hold our own as far as the musical aspect and as far as an entertainment group. We, we're not just cute little kids anymore. And so maybe a little more pressure along with that, but if I had to go handpick the musicians myself to form a group, I would probably pick my brothers. Bye. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't. We both hear it. See, the boys are getting older. They're getting. They're getting smarter. They. They have rationale uh, now to argue with their dad. He can't just say something now and expect them just to go away. They won't go away. They're in his face all the time. If they disagree, they let him know. And then in the second half, the other boys have ideas too, and they accuse me of being dictatorial. They accuse me of being like Adolf Hitler, or Attila the Hun. And I always tell them, when you get your family, then you will rule. 
and you will do it however you wish. But right now, this is my family, and it's my turn. Now do it my way, and let's not argue. Okay, come here. Wally is well aware that uh, the boys can do it. It's just a matter of, you know, he is still there. Um, he enjoys it also. Um, these are his sons. He's extremely proud of them. The unifying thing is when we perform. All that trouble melts away and we perform. And that holds us together better than anything else. In most families, time and circumstances separate children from parents, brother from brother. And so the Depew family looks ahead, not knowing if they will experience future success together. But a family story lives on through the children that we are, to the adults that we become. And whether the Depew family musicians continue or the boys go their separate ways, they will always be together, for they share the simple love of music for every occasion. The boys want to be together in show business. That's been their dream. It's a hard dream to realize because you've got so many of them in school. And now we have them starting to leave the family and go to graduate school and so forth. Wally's 23, I mean... He might decide to get married. You know, maybe he wants to have kids. And if so, then, hey, start a family orchestra. <laughs> As each of the boys uh, leaves, yes, it's going to be very difficult uh, for Wally. Uh, I don't know whether he, he would own up to that, but it, it's going to be very difficult. Well, I'll say I won. I won that one. I think... Wallace is going to become a superb orchestral musician. He'll be somebody's concert master. He reads the spots right off the page. He loves the sound around him. But he's not crazy about standing out there in front of everybody. Jason is. Jason wants to be the guy out in the middle of the spotlight, thrilling an audience with the sound of that instrument. Alex wants to be the greatest fiddler in the whole world. And maybe he is already. He has not been beaten in my mind by anybody I have ever heard. And Zach, he has the biggest and most beautiful sound of anybody in the family. When he draws that bow across that string, it just thrills me. My baby's in here somewhere. I was hoping to run into him. Call it the musical arts. It's like deja vu to me. I'm a part of each one of those boys. Each one of them to me is like a part of my being. Like another arm, another leg. So whenever they have a success, I have a success. And whenever they have a failure, I have a failure. And it hurts me as much as it does them. But I taught them all. There are two things you must be able to do as you go through life. You've got to learn first to take a punch. And then you've got to learn how to give one. Because life is a balance. Half of it's taken and half of it's giving. Day. Good morning and congratulations to all of the graduating class. I want you to know how. All right. without them, I'll still be glad that they're having an opportunity to do what I did. And so I'll be able to compensate emotionally 
some pretty good things to think about too and that is I won't have to referee anymore I never enjoyed refereeing <laughs> and now I'll be able to give that up I won't have to be buying everybody's strings and rehearing everybody's bows and fixing everybody's guitars anymore either if you went down two less parallel there are a lot of advantages for the boys to be going their own ways and a loss of, a lot of disadvantages I love them all dearly, and that's the worst disadvantage of having to lose them. Music for Every Occasion, the story of the DePew family musicians is made possible by financial support from the D.S. Brown Company, Bowling Green State University, and the supporting members of WBGU-TV. Well, that was an easy one. We laughed. We cried. That was the DePew brothers the DePew family musicians actually back then I'm glad you're here glad you made it we'll see you next week same time same place you've been listening to the first forum